Disney Plus and Hulu better together in a brand new bundle. Ready for an adventure? The greatest stories ever told on Disney Plus with The Mandalorian and Disenchanted. That's wicked. Wicked good. Critically acclaimed fan favorites on Hulu like Pam and Tommy and The Bear. Let's take it up another level. Save big when you bundle both for just $9.99 a month. We're so good together. All of these and more now streaming. Savings compared to regular monthly price of each service. 18 and over only. Access content from each service separately. Offer valid for eligible subscribers only. Terms apply. See DisneyBundle.com for details. Why do dry January when you can do sweaty January? This year, jumpstart your fitness goals with $500 off Peloton Bike, Bike Plus, or Tread Packages. Choose the package that will take your training to the next level with accessories like our cycling shoes, heart rate band, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. All access membership separate. Offer ends January 8th, 2023. Excludes Bike, Bike Plus, and Tread Basics. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. When it comes to fitness, what's real? How about when it really, truly fits your life? That's how Anytime Fitness sees it. Because our coaches see you. It's how they build personal plans that work wherever you are and focus on everything that matters, from fitness to nutrition to recovery, all so you can push yourself further than ever or just through the next rep. It's total 360 support for a real difference. That's Anytime Fitness. That's Real AF. Visit anytimefitness.com. Welcome back to the Love Tennis Podcast with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. Uh, I'm here, of course, joined by George Belshaw, the tennis writer, and our resident tennis coach, Calvin Beton. And I think we're running out of time to say this, but happy new year, chaps. Uh, Calvin, how did you see in 2023? Um, I think I was watching Roadhouse, the uh, <laughs> Patrick Swayze film from the mid-1980s. So, yeah. Rock and roll as usual, then. It's right mm. up there at the top of films that are so bad they're brilliant. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that like goes for a lot of Patrick Swayze films, right? Yeah, pretty much all of them. This one in in every this is a top three in films that are so bad they're brilliant. It's hugely entertaining. I'd love to hear the rest <laughs> of that list at some point in another week. Well, point Break be, being the one that springs to mind. Are you saying that Point Break's bad in any way? Uh, great. I, film. I think I think the script has a lot of. <laughs> A lot to be desired. Uh, George, how did you see in New Year? I assume you were 12 pints deep in some awful Birmingham nightclub. <laughs> no, I didn't go clubbing. I, I went to um, my family's favourite curry house at about 11.30. And then me and my brother and sister... Uh, Sorry, did you go drinks. for a curry at 11.30? No, no, it finished at 11.30. We went oh, about see, 8 o'clock. Okay. Right, okay. And then kind of went home... Saw it in with the Hootenanny and lots of sherry, basically. Oh, which never the Hootenanny, quite George. Funny. I, I quite mean... like it. I, I, I don't do it very often, but I, I think it's a bad rap. It, when you're pretty, you know, well on your way, I think it's quite a nice thing to watch. You see the music, see some bad chat. What's the Hootenanny, think... the Jules Holland thing? Yeah. Do you know when that is filmed, though, by the way? Yeah, could, it's in like, actually... summer, isn't it? Oh, no, it's not that bad. I keep saying that to people, and they're always like, oh, it's really early. Is the answer was like December fourteenth, but even so, right. I was always thinking like, what if like, obviously the Queen died earlier this year, but what if one year like the Queen died in between and they were needed to like work to like, reshoot the special? whole thing? Well, no, what if what if That's somebody was on it? What if somebody was on it died? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that, that'd yeah, be even I more mean, awkward. Jules himself, it wouldn't be a great way to see it. Then, would it? The posthumous Jules Holland Hootenanny. <laughs> Uh, what a load of nonsense. Of course, to, to like non-UK listeners, of whom there are many, uh, this <laughs> will mean absolutely nothing. Uh, but maybe just YouTube Jules Holland Hootenanny and you'll see quite how old we're all feeling. Can I ask another question, James, about your intro? And at what, what point we're allowed to make our big reveal? Because I heard you called us a name and I'm wondering at what stage... I know I've sort of teased this in a few episodes, and I'm wondering if I'm teasing people even more now, but are we going to finally unleash the tease at some point today? Well, particularly uh, keen and eagle-eyed Twitter followers will have seen there's been a change of handle. Uh, and we'll I see that... seen that, which is bad <laughs> Yeah, Not including George Belshaw. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see that we are undergoing something of a, an evolution 
Uh, we're currently in a chrysalis, and in the next couple of days we will emerge a fully formed butterfly uh, from the caterpillar that was Love Tennis Podcast. We will have a new name. Uh, we are going to be Tennis Unfiltered, which would suggest that up to now we've been rather filtered. I can't wait to see what an unfiltered Calvin Beton looks like. Uh, I can only assume it's going to be spectacular. Um, but I think probably for most listeners, not much will change. There'll be a few new elements. Um, we hope we're going to do a few things a bit better. Uh, we'll look quite different on social media. Um, people who've been long-term listeners will know that the reason we're called the Love Tennis Podcast at the moment is we were part of a radio station called Love Sport Radio, and it was a kind of co-brand. That radio station no longer exists. And we Hasn't thought for a it while. Was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It went bust about <laughs> three years ago. And we thought it was time for a little bit of a change, but it'll still be me, it'll still be George, it'll still be Calvin. Um, we will be as unfiltered and unhinged as we ever have been, um, and hopefully it'll encourage a few more of you to, to come and have a listen. Um, I should also say thank you to you, the listener, because it's only through um, the fact that you've been listening and downloading the podcast that we have been able to do this. Um, we've used some of the money that we've made through the the various partnerships that you remember over the year and, and the advertising that we have on the pod um, to pay an excellent guy called Luke to do a load of graphic designs for us, do some new logos that hopefully look really good. Um, and there might be a few more things in the pipeline going forward that will also hopefully uh, excite people um, in terms of what we look like. But yes, we are Tennis Unfiltered as of about two days' time. Um, we will still appear in your feeds the normal way. If you're already subscribed to the podcast, you will still be subscribed to the podcast. It'll just look a little bit different, but hopefully it will sound much the same. Um, and if you've got feelings about that or if you or anything else for that matter or something you want to see on Tennis Unfiltered or here on Tennis Unfiltered, then drop us an email. Lovetennispod at gmail.com is the email address at the moment. You can always email that because it's going to be forwarding to a new email address. Um, but you can always get in touch with us that way. Or indeed, on Twitter, our new handle is Unfilter Tennis. Uh, frustratingly, Tennis Unfiltered is one character too long to be used <laughs> as our actual Twitter handle. But there you go. Um, if you're already following us, then you will still be able to. Um, and as always, you can find me, James Gray Sport, Calvin Calv Beton on Twitter. And Belshaw George uh, is your handle, I think, George. Have I got that right? Okay, yeah, great. nailed it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, well, as I say, hopefully not much will change. We'll still be talking about tennis. We'll still be as insane as we always are. And well, hopefully we'll talk a bit less about Jules Holland. Um, this week we're going to talk uh, about the United Cup because that is approaching its climax. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the first tour events of the year. There's action over in Auckland when it's not raining uh, and also over in Adelaide where there's a, a really packed draw. We'll talk a bit about Feliciano Lopez. Uh, Martina Navratilova, some troubling news for her. Um, Emma Raducanu retired overnight here in the UK uh, with yet another injury. We'll discuss what that means for her Australian Open hopes. Boris Becker might come up and Venus Williams too. I think we should start with the United Cup though because that has been ongoing for the last week or so and Britain have had a pretty decent run. They made it through to the City final uh, because of the way this format, this tournament has format, but it was effectively a quarter-final up against a very strong United States team. Uh, they went down fighting, they lost 4-1 as it was in the end. Cam Norrie with the sole victory uh, for the Brits over Taylor Fritz. Very notable victory there. Katie Swan went a set-up against Madison Keys, but lost in three. Uh, Harriet Dart was soundly defeated by Jessica Pagula and then... Francis TFO won the deciding set to seal it uh, against Dan Evans. Um, George, we have obviously talked about this tournament lots in various different ways, and the format has been unusual. We're now down to the semi-final stages where we've got Poland against the United States and Greece against Italy. Uh, I looked at the matches that that is going to throw up and thought, well, it's actually a pretty good tournament, really, isn't it? It's it's produced some exciting ties, and it's going to have some really high-quality matches in the latter stages. Yeah, definitely. And I've actually got a friend who lives in Brisbane and he, he went along this week. He's not, not a huge tennis fan, but he kind of likes sport and you obviously get a fair amount of sport kicking around the Gabba, etc. around there. Um, and he he really enjoyed it. And the one thing he actually picked out as the bit he found 
most different or something he'd not experienced in the past when he's gone to the Alger tennis event was the mixed doubles side of things. He's not seen a match before and he said he really enjoyed that. It was the uh, Italy-Poland match that he went mm. to, which was obviously really close all day and came down to the mixed doubles, um, which her cats and fiance won to uh, come through. So, yeah, I, I think that's always quite nice when you've got a format that displays mixed doubles, but having high-profile players playing mixed doubles we don't get that as often as we should and i think that was that was probably the best bit of the hotman cup when it was its most successful i know some people there's a bit of a revisionism about the hotman cup in the sense that everyone kind of thinks back to that serena roger tie you know i think that's because that was like the last one a lot of people think that's how it was every year it wasn't always as glamorous or fun as that but that showed the power or potential power of kind of mixed doubles when you get big stars together so a format like this that does force them into that sort of um, style I think it's only good things and also gives them a bit of match practice without wearing them out before the Australian Open so I think it's quite a good thing for the players as well as spectators so yeah I think it's been a good format and um, our friend Stephen Farrow who used to be tournament director of Queen's has been a, an instrumental force working on this so as ever he's one of tennis's very best administrators I've always thought so he, I'll give him a little shout out as well He's also got three young kids. I don't know quite how he does it. I was texting him just <laughs> yeah. before the tournament saying, I, have you slept? And he's like, no, but I've been training for this. I'll be all right. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it has been a bit of a, a force of nature. Um, mixed doubles, Calvin, as someone who coaches two very good doubles players, um, do, do players enjoy mixed doubles? Does it have any different elements to it from like a tactical perspective other than I mean, presumably the obvious thing is you really try and take advantage of the female serve because it's generally the weaker one. Um, most players don't play it uh, because mm. it's only um, at the slams that you can play it and it's generally a 32 draw. Yeah. So getting in it is is pretty tough because you're basically looking at the top 20 players in the world uh, mm. who are going to get in it. And then a few wild cards depending on what's around so basically you've only got the four the four slams and um now the united cup where it actually takes place so i think a lot of players they don't really have an opinion whether they like playing it or not um mm. uh, and it's yeah, strange i guess but basically i was going to say it's i mean you know the way to win is and this is I, I hope it doesn't sound horribly uh testosterone fueled or anything but the way to win is you can just the if the female plays at the net the male player can just hit it straight at them because purely a, a strength thing that they the female player won't be able to volley against the male's ground strokes if mm. if at full pace. But to be fair, a, most players tend not to do that. But you do get the odd one, and you do wonder if, for example, on Sunday if the United Cups up up for grabs and it's eight all in the tiebreak or something, we think we might see might see it happening. But that's been quite interesting as well because I mean I know Iga Shontek is a freak and she's the world number one, but like watching her play doubles and like receiving from Lorenzo Mazzetti the other day and like just like climbing into returns and I, I see Mazzetti has pulled out of Adelaide too and so I don't know whether he was carrying an issue but like it 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 was exciting to see that and to see like someone like Eugene Shontek stepping up and and George I mean you play a lot of club tennis presumably mixed doubles is it was something club players play a lot more than pro players play. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I mean, it's one of my formats of choice, to be honest, at this level. I love it. You'll be shocked to hear. Um, and <laughs> On I, a number of yeah, levels, I, that does not surprise me. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think it's always a bit of a it's a bit of a shame, isn't it, that it hasn't really translated so much into the professional game. I, d I don't necessarily mean that in the sense of I think mixed doubles produces the best. It's, you know, for me, I still prefer watching top level singles compared to other formats, even though I play doubles a lot more than singles. I think hmm. the very best singles matches is the highest quality you get in sport, really. Um, and I mean, that beyond tennis as well is superb and one of my favorite things. But it's a shame that we don't tap into more, in, and this is doubles more generally being kind of promoted because so many people do play it at club level and it is something people are interested in. And a lot of people who love playing tennis they love watching the doubles because they're thinking oh what are they doing how can i take that back to my club whereas playing singles at club level is a lot more rare unless you're going kind to of playing like national league level stuff which i did and used to get trounced at weekly um <laughs> when i was a younger lad um but the other thing the other side of it that's specific to mixed doubles 
that I'm always kind of urging tennis to do more is that I, I think the big selling point of tennis as a sport, and I'm, I'm taking this from our media lens as much as anything, James, in terms of how you sell a sport, is the fact you've got men and women virtually paid equally, you know, a few rungs aside, far better than any other sport, out there equally in the limelight in many ways. It's great for stories. It hits stories that other sports like football, like cricket, like rugby, who are trying to push their kind of women's sports, but they're not as predominant as tennis is or as level the playing field as men's and women's tennis is. And just by the very nature of having these big, high profile athletes creates these stories and these interests that you can't get from a male only sport. And then the other thing that doesn't happen, and this can't well, it could potentially happen in some sports, but not many due to kind of the physical issues of, you know, imagine, you know, Lucy Bronze running against a six foot four centre back or something at the male level. You know, there's such a physical dominance that it's hard to stick them on the same pitch and make it a good product. But in tennis, you've got this kind of buffer of a racket. You can have a man and woman. And that in itself can, gen- I, as we saw with Federer and Serena, it can generate really good stories and get people really interested. And I, I just think it's always such a great shame that tennis doesn't try and promote this. And I know you've got the problem from the player side, but this format feels like a really good kind of happy medium where you've got that good level singles, you've got this mixed doubles finally put forward centre that's going to attract top level players playing it all the time rather than just the odd random slam pairing where you get, you know, a Jamie Murray and an Azarenka, which is fine, but it's not the same as a, a Federer Serena or a Murray Serena, as we have seen at Wimbledon as well. So, yeah, I I hope it kicks off and I hope it goes well because I'd love to see more mixed doubles and I'd love to see more top players kind of playing it at the slams. Um, I think the problem with it at this, and it's been a problem in this format, is that you're not going to see many matches where it's live, whether mm. the, the tie is still mm. live. It's... If you're going to play it last, it's it's by far the least likely option that it will still be alive by the time it gets to the mixed doubles because you could have 4-0, 3-1, either way. And then the only way it can be still live is at 2-all. And I think we've seen a lot of that. But also, as George said, you know, yeah, it would be nice if, if it happened more, but it's just never going to happen because the top players just won't play it in tournaments. That's that's guaranteed because if they're they're still I same as said last week about normal doubles never mind mixed doubles if they're still in the tournament in singles they won't want to be wasting their energy playing mixed doubles and if they're out of the tournament they won't want to be hanging around playing mixed doubles. Yeah, I think as Gavin says, like I always think with these little events, it would be much better to have the doubles as rubber three, really. Like that's always a kind of good happy medium, and it also creates. Um, the sense particularly in this tournament where the singles players are getting ranking points there's still that motivation for them whereas you know if you're having a kind of dead rubber mixed doubles that's probably just going to be a bit of a laugh and a bit pointless um even though you know some of the group stage double rubbers do count so i always think it'd be nice to get the doubles kind of rubber three have your your top singles players your mixed doubles and then finish it off with your you two or even you, you could even you could even do it whereby on each match you draw the, ma- the ties are drawn out, so it's different each match. Mm. Where well, you could have oh, the mixed doubles yeah. first, and you know, especially while it's being played over two days, it's not so much of a problem then. And yeah. you go, and then that that adds a different dynamic to it, and you and it be, you get different levels of how live the tie is. Albeit, well, I, I I think you then like I don't know how much players would like that. Like I think there's an attraction at the moment that. You know, Cam Norrie knew pretty much which days he was going to play on, almost before yeah. it even started. You don't know that in tournaments, though. You know, you no, go to a tournament. No, but that's what I mean. To, like, yeah. You, yeah. you want to say to a player, "This is the reason you should come play the United Cup." You'd be like, "You'll play on this day and this day. You'll get good match practice." For yeah. Well, George. Yeah, the idea of a draw. I've probably droned on about this before, but the idea of a draws in tennis, I, I always think. Oh yeah, randomize anyway. randomize the third round of Wimbledon. FA Cup draw yeah. would be great <laughs> for one of the slams. Uh, needs to happen at some point. I, I mean, it kind of staggers me. I, I know it's partly because the tours don't let you do it, and every tournament is mandated. But and I, I feel a bit like a broken record on this as well, George. But like snooker paves the way for me on this, where like ranking events, there are four or five different ways of doing it. Different, like some of them are group stages. There's like the one frame shootout. Like, why isn't tennis more open? Like, what is the difference between tennis tournaments? They're in a different place. That's literally the only difference between tennis tournaments. 
It's the exceptionalism that tennis has. It's the same as like we can't allow coaching on because tennis is one of those sports where players figure things out for themselves. <laughs> and, and, and like no one uh, still I uh, repeat it's still waiting to find anyone who can explain to me why that is a good thing and why that would really change if coaches yeah. could speak every couple of games yeah and and you know one of the things we've seen about the united cup is that they've really relaxed the coaching rules and it it's been really interesting for me i mean because i had it on kind of while doing other things and you know, I was like, oh, it would hit a changeover and I'd be like, oh, I'll make sure I listen to this because you've got a mic in the box and you get to hear what a coach is saying to a player. And I, I, I found nothing more instructive and interesting than that, quite frankly. And, and yeah, that point about getting people talking is great. And we hear Calvin, you know, getting really annoyed at Tim Henman, for example, and not and hating people's opinions on Tim Henman probably more accurately to say... <laughs> Um, but it's good though because it does create that sort of conversation. It's something we wouldn't be talking about otherwise. That... What did some I, people you, think you it learned was good? So much. Did some people think what he was doing was good? A lot of people <laughs> thought. Honestly, I saw so many tweets being like, "Can I have Tim Henman like at my local club, please? Can I have Tim Henman on my alarm clock?" I mean, wow. I've not seen a I, negative tweet, Calvin. Honestly, apart from, did you tweet about it? Or did, I didn't tweet I about it. I don't know. I might have done. Can't remember. <laughs> what was your much. What was your What was your grievance, Calvin? <sighs> My grievance was I, I, I despise white noise in coaching, and I'm sure that. Well, I know that Tim knows the game, um, and I know that. It, from the players that he spoke to that he has some good some very very good stuff in there and i heard some very very good stuff in there the stuff i thought that he said to katie swan that when nadal turned up he said to her you know the other girl's going to start getting nervous now because rafa's in the box and that was that was such you know real high-end stuff and it, and it really mm. played a part i think it calmed katie down i think he told evo a couple of times yesterday to start throwing in some serve volley and that worked however some good and I think it would have been even better I think it would have been even more effective if he'd have just toned down the relentless white noise that he was coming out with after every single point all mm. the time and it was it didn't mean anything you know when you heard it it was just right here come on now right here great great here we go this one this one get a look at this one here we go right here right here now here we go great great and the, all that happens there is the players just start tuning out as much as you might think it's motivational and there's nothing wrong with firing in one of those once every two or three points the players it's the, the players will just tune out so anything if you deliver the good stuff in the middle of the white noise the players won't hear it because they've just tuned out they can only take in anyone when when you coach and i the, one of the best piece of advice i ever was given on coaching is that anything you can't deliver on a post it note is too long Anything that you can, anything, any advice that you want to give a player, make sure it can be printed on a T-shirt. And that that's what you want. And not the constant stream that Tim was constantly saying. And I, I found, not only that, I found it unwatchable, to be honest. <laughs> I get, yeah, it, it, it sounds more like kind of what you'd expect on like a federal or a Davis, sorry, BJK or Davis Cup bench, that sort of kind of permanent. No, it wasn't. Yeah, you though, got because, it. You go. No, but yeah, maybe a Fed Cup type thing, but not even then. You know, like Leon. Leon's taking a bit of stick for the Davis Cup stuff, but Leon knows what he's doing on the bench. You know, he'll clap and he'll nod and that kind of thing, but he's not constantly talking mm. and not saying anything. <clears throat> it's the definition of talking a lot and saying nothing. Mm. What what Tim was yeah. doing. To, to be fair, I wasn't I wasn't talking about Leon there specifically. More just no. like the people on the bench. No, like, but what I'm saying is to like say things. What I'm saying is that Leon has had a lot of success. He's won the thing. He's made a couple of semi-finals as well by knowing in the right time to say something, delivering delivering a key bit of information to the to to the player. And hmm. you know, I I think like I say, I just wor I I just wish Tim would have toned it down because I'm certain that he's got a lot of good stuff to say. I, I know he has, because I've, I've yeah. heard it. I, I wondered, I mean, I'm not saying Tim was nervous, but like there was definitely an element. It, it was particularly like 
the first 20 seconds after the game, you know, player comes over, sits down, and you get some of those, like, you know, the, that white, those white noises, and you're like, great serving, well done, yeah, love that. And Tim would just sort of stand in front of the player and, like, shift his weight between his feet. I, I know what you're saying, yeah, but I think what it is, James, as well, is it's, and I, and I, I don't want to sound like a bell when I'm saying this, but it's an, a level of inexperience from Tim from a mm. coaching point of view, that he's not done it. And I think what tends to happen then is that you tend to you tend to want to have to justify your place. You start worrying. And it, it is like, you know, I've been there previously and I like to think I'm better at it now, that you start thinking, I've got to say something here or they'll think, why is he even there? But they never yeah. think that. The players are fo- focused on it. So you're better off just waiting, waiting until you've got something of value to say. Like some of the stuff, I'm sure as well that Tim will listen back and go like, what you want about there? Like there was there was a period where he said something like, "Get a look at a second serve." <laughs> like well, that, he doesn't have any power over that. <laughs> it depends if the other guy misses one. <laughs> like, it's not a, a tactic, isn't? Get a look at a second serve. <laughs> Let's see his hamstring, lads. Let's see his hamstring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I I also have to say, like, uh, in very kind of amateur terms, whenever you're stood next to someone on the court and someone says to you. Oh, yeah, go on, get get a look at this, and then they hit the serve right on the line and goes past you. You just feel like I tried my best. So you've made me feel like a complete twat. But also, but, you know? also <laughs> but also though, if you're doing that, if you're constantly talking and constantly thinking you have to justify your own uh, presence there, you're missing the stuff. You're not really focusing on it. You're you're focusing on your mind is then on what you can say rather than just sitting watching the tennis match and spotting the little patterns that may be emerging that that is going on. Hmm. Um, to, to bring us ruthlessly back to the tennis briefly as well um, I thought it was worth mentioning Cam Norrie's performances uh, in the United Cup because he went unbeaten Britain's number one player obviously like not someone we associate with those team events because he's not the most effusive or you know necessarily the biggest talker and you know you've got Evo on the bench who talks for four anyway so it's not too much of an issue but um, he beat Alex de Menor, he beat uh, Taylor Fritz and I think most impressively of all although I appreciate he's not fully fit he beat Rafael Nadal um, do we I mean starting the year with three wins over top are they all top 10 players I mean de Menor is not but um, it's still a good set of results George isn't it uh, yeah I'm not at all surprised James because I've been backing him to win the Australian Open after his exhibition exhibition so, <laughs> um, it's good to see that carry through and he, yeah he'll be winning another seven matches in Melbourne <laughs> High uh, quality no, hitting in Saudi Arabia. That's what he had. Yeah. Uh, but no, look, Cam, this is going to be another interesting season for Cam because, you know, I think we all think he's done pretty well this year again to kind of maintain where he was. The challenge now is can he go any higher? I think it's really hard to stick around where Cam Norrie is for a player like Cam Norrie, who it doesn't have the weapons at his disposal. I think of someone like David Goffin, who spent a lot of time in top 10 for years on years and years. And definitely in terms of weapons and what he had, wasn't necessarily a top player. You could say David Ferrer is another great example of someone, you know, they. I'm not saying these guys aren't really, really talented, brilliant tennis players, but when you look at the arm armory other players have in comparison, if they can get all the things right that players like Cam, Ferrer, Goffin get right, um, they, they would be comfortably better players in some ways. Mm. Um, so yeah, the challenge for him is now how much can he keep pushing on? You know, jokes aside, can he can he go one better at a slam? Go from a semi final to a final? That would be an amazing achievement for Norrie and something I couldn't believe would have happened if you'd have said that to me three years ago. I would I'd have taken so much money against you, like the thought of Cam Norrie coming anywhere close to winning a Grand Slam. Um, Second week even, yeah. yeah. Um do you but, think that's a fair comparison, Calvin? David Ferrer, Cam Norrie, is that is that the kind of player we should be thinking about him as now? don't think he's that level to be honest um i mean ferrer made a couple of slam finals i don't know if um i don't know if cam's going to be doing that but um you know not far off and similar you know similar in the the notion that they both make a lot of balls and they both work extremely hard cam i guess is a bit more unique than ferrer um he offers a different different problems to solve for his opponents than Ferrer did. Ferrer was just a workhorse and, 
you know, he, he was he's right handed. He was a bog standard counter punching baseliner. Whereas Cam mm. offers a bit different in the the way he hits his backhand, the way he hits his forehand, and he's a lefty. Um, but I think uh, I, I think you know Ferrer would at the minute, unless Cam you know moves on again in the next eighteen months, two years. I think Cam uh, Ferrer would be the better player. Um, and just briefly, Norrie's not to take anything away from him. Um, he beat Rafa Nadal. He's never even taken a set off him before, so um, that's obviously a huge positive for him, as psychologically as it is um, for tennis-wise, I suppose, Calvin. Yeah, it's always a big win when you beat one of those guys uh, the first time you beat them. It gives you some belief. Um, but yeah, I'll say quickly as well, I, I actually think Evo was pretty unlucky and, and Britain were pretty unlucky against the um, United States because he was he was the better player against Tiafo, And then I think it was four all in the second set. He was a set up four all. He had love 40. And then mm. um, Tiafo hit the very back edge of the line in a long rally that could easily have gone long. And then he held from there. And then on the first point of Evo's service game at 5-6, I think, or 5-6, yeah, maybe. Um, no, I think it was 5 all when Evo served. Maybe. No, it wasn't. No, no, 5-6, yeah. Right. 5-6. Can we just... Um, <laughs> um, Look, but I, then at 5-6, he got... Uh, I'll just be quick. And then he got a net cord on the first point of the net game, next game to go love 15. And then he broke with a, a mishit lob return to win the set. And I think if any one of those things doesn't happen, I think Evo probably wins the match. But all three of them happened in the space of about four minutes. Mm. And if Evo wins that match, then, you know, it's then two all. We go to a crucial mixed doubles. All right, you probably still back Pagula yeah. and Fritz to beat Dart and Evans in mixed doubles. But, but you never know. And, you know, doubles, as you well know, Calvin, doubles is an incredibly close run thing at the best of times especially with yeah. um with the uh uh juice the no ad scoring you know it doesn't yeah. take much for for ties to swing but yes united states through to the semi-finals they take on poland greece against italy in the other semi-finals going on this weekend of course uh, after the break we'll talk about emma raducanu this episode is sponsored by state farm buying insurance can be complicated and you might have a lot of questions, like, what if my policy doesn't cover that? Or, what if I need to make a claim in the middle of the night? Good news, State Farm is there for all your what-ifs. You can reach them 24-7, talk through any questions with your agent, and you can even file a claim on the State Farm mobile app. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com to get a quote today. When it comes to fitness, what's real? How about when it really, truly fits your life? That's how Anytime Fitness sees it. Because our coaches see you. It's how they build personal plans that work wherever you are and focus on everything that matters, from fitness to nutrition to recovery, all so you can push yourself further than ever or just through the next rep. It's total 360 support for a real difference. That's Anytime Fitness. That's real AF. Visit anytimefitness.com. Welcome back to the Love Tennis Podcast, soon to be uh, Tennis Unfiltered. Don't get a shock if a new podcast appears in your feeds next week. We will be called Tennis Unfiltered as of next week. A little reminder of that from me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. We'll still have George Belshaw. We'll still have Calvin Betton. Very little else will change. We might have some, some new bells and whistles, but we are still... The same three blokes complaining about tennis. Um, I wanted to talk about Emma Raducanu next because uh, some quite sad scenes uh, from overnight or early this morning, depending on which time zone or which country you're in. This confusion about what day it is is only going to get worse when I fly to Australia in a couple of days, by the way, so I apologise in advance for that. Um, Emma Raducanu beat uh, Linda Fruvitova in the first round in a a pretty ding-dong match that lasted more than two and a half hours, but she came through that well. Uh, she then bageled Victoria Kuzmova in the first set um, of their second round match. She then lost the second set 7-5 and then went over on her left ankle. She was only able to play one more point after that, having received treatment before um, being forced to retire. She left the court in tears. It was it was quite troubling to see that. Um, and 11 days from the start of the Australian Open, George, Emma Raducanu's got her ankle presumably on ice and kind of praying for good news from a scan. Yeah, it's it's really frustrating and disappointing again. Uh, I mean, she she put forward her 
main goals for this season. One of them was to win a title. One of them was, you know, well, the main one was really to try and stay physically fit and to kind of have your first matches of the year and like this is is really not ideal you know she she's spoken a lot about the physical work she's done in the gym and you know i think we've all maybe questioned her conditioning in the past and said that's an area that that needs improvement there's been a lot of issues but a rolling of an ankle is one of those things that you know <laughs> that can happen mm. in any sport you know that that sort of thing is it can be pretty freaking yeah I, I saw she had a bit of a, a um aimed a bit of criticism at the at the court maybe being a bit slippy as well um so yeah it's, it, it's a big shame and hopefully it's as you say james like a minor thing but that's not going to help her her uh, preparation chances and you know for her her poor trial coach as well, <laughs> it's not really the way you want to start that relationship is it you know particularly mm. knowing how quickly they're being chopped and changed if you you might only get two matches at this rate. <laughs> well, quite. Um, you mentioned that she had a bit of a dig at the courts. Um, anyone who's been following the uh, tournament in Auckland will know it's been raining a lot in Auckland. I had to explain to someone on social media who said, why do they always hold these tournaments in the rainy season? I was like, this is the second driest month in New Zealand. Uh, it just rains there sometimes. Get over it. Um, but she... This match was played indoors, as many of them have had to be, because there's a lot of rain this week. Um, and she mentioned the court. She said, I thought I was playing some pretty decent tennis. The courts are incredibly slick, very slippery, so it's not a surprise that this happened to someone. It's out of making my control and after a very long day of waiting around, but we'll assess it over the next few days and see what the next steps are. Um, Calvin, I mean, I, I just wonder if switching from being ready to play an outdoor match to being ready to play an indoor match, I mean are you supposed to change shoes like i'm just thinking if there are specific nah. reasons same shoes no yeah for hard court they're both hard courts so be the same shoes mm. um but but a very different set of conditions probably. yeah but i think that was probably just a freak you know you can roll your ankle it happens mm. um yeah i you know i'd i'd be staggered if she's not in the australian open like you know it's it's pay the thing is with ankles like that if you she she turned it, I think, rather than rolled it. And mm. I think, you know, it's one of those that's very, very painful when it happens and it swells up. But unless there's any ligament damage, which I, I doubt there is from seeing it and having seen a lot of ankles and having very, very unstable ankles myself. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've numerous times I've um, I've rolled rolled my ankle and thought that's that's me done for not being able to walk for a few weeks and then... 36 hours later the swelling's gone down and you know and three days later you can just play at full pace again yeah um i'd be that yeah i mean you know it'd be upsetting because she had to lose the match because of it but I'd, I'd be very shocked if she's not fully fit for the aussie open in 11 days time george you mentioned the new coach sebastian Sachs, um who's been working with her for the last couple of weeks uh there were a few signs potentially of his influence uh, in that match against Kuzmova, um, we saw a couple of really aggressive return positions getting quite high up the court, um, spending a little bit more time in the forecourt, maybe trying to end points or be a bit more aggressive um, in terms of the way she was playing. Does that does that feel like a natural progression? Uh, Calvin may have other views, but... Well, you've just, you've just reminded me, James, of the third thing I couldn't remember she said she wanted to do this year, which was the uh, rather vacuously said, hit the ball with no fear. So that, <laughs> that implies that is uh, starting to happen. Uh, look, I think <clears throat> I think we've seen Emma play some really good matches, particularly at the US Open, where she just goes after the ball. And, mm. you know, she's a fantastic ball striker. Um, and she can move really well as well. I've seen other matches where she's, she has, you know, for all we kind of take the mick out of the kind of like fear of hitting the ball sort of thing. I've seen a lot of matches where she's just been pushing it pretty gently and it's almost felt like she's trying to be a better tactical player than she actually is when a lot of her quality comes from this kind of pure ball striking. Um, and she's almost got into this habit of trying to roll the ball and try and be a bit tactical and then players who've got more to their game have just spotted her away and made her look pretty ordinary pretty quickly. So... Yeah, look, I don't. I think Kuzmova's a decent player. I don't think. I think Raducanu's still got to start proving herself against better WTA players. I think this is a match we can realistically expect her to be winning. 
you know, injury aside this time. So I'm I'm not going to sit here and say it was an amazing, you know, six loves good, but then she's let let it become a tighter map. So she's not entirely blown her away. Um, you know, there's going to be much firmer challenges this going forward. But yeah, hopefully the coach can get it right. And hopefully, more importantly, he's given the time to get it right. Because at the end of the day, it's pretty pointless having two months of someone trying to work with you, develop your game and not see, you know, if the results are fruitful over like a, at least a six month period would be nice if we could even get to that this year. Calvin, I, I know you would agree with that. Um, would you agree that a more aggressive Radicanu, a, a, you know, a more forward thinking Radicanu is the right type Radicanu and that we have seen her maybe try and shape the ball a bit too much over the last 12 months? Um, I'm always wary of this idea. Players always say they want to be more aggressive. It's always like, it's kind of, I want to be more aggressive this year. And then they'll be <laughs> aggressive and they'll make too many errors. They go, I need to be more consistent. And then it just goes like just goes like that. What what I want to see from her, what she, when she's at her best, she's a complete player. She defends great. She attacks great. And I want to see that. The problem is, and I wouldn't say she was hitting, she was being too negative last year. I said it last year a few times that I think she was playing points like she was drilling. She's known to do it. They were doing a lot of drills, um, a lot of cross-court drills and that kind of thing. And that's how she started playing. And it, and it, it just it, it took a lot of variation out of a game. So, like I say, well, she's at her best when she's a complete player. And that's what I want to see. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because if you think about the kind of best women's players and men's players in the game at the minute and you track their improvements, what happens you're thinking about those who are improving every aspect of their game, not just one. And the idea of just being more aggressive is really just thinking about this kind of forward attack that Sviontek has come on leaps and bounds in her defensive work, as good as her offensive side is. Alcaraz, you know, he's got, he's really increased his capabilities of covering the court, but also having this aggression, this great defence, and he's improved at his volleying and net play as well. So, you know, I think you do have to think about it in the round and not just treat it as one one angle. You know, there'll be a, an aspect where she's kind of just saying things to the media occasionally and just batting things away, I'm sure. But again, this is something that probably comes from having a bit more of a stabilised team around you when you can take everything together rather than one small aspect that you want to push forward. If she's going to get back to the top 15, the top 10 in the world, she's not going to get she's not going to do that by just hitting huge balls she doesn't hit the ball as big as some of the other players she doesn't hit the ball anywhere near as big as Naomi Osaka or um, Sabalenka or um, Coco Goff or Anisimova Uh, she doesn't hit the ball as big as those girls so saying that she wants to come out and be more aggressive that won't that won't be what takes her there what takes her there will be she's a she's good tactician on the court um, and she's got other elements you know she's she's a complete player Yes, quite. Sorry, George, I thought you were going to jump in there, but I got confused about the uh, finger. Oh, my face. System. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, yeah, so we're going to see, presumably, um, well, we expect to hear something in the next 36 hours about exactly what the prognosis is on Radicani's ankle. Um, but as Calvin says, I, I kind of tempted to agree with you that I don't think there's any chance that she'll pull out. She'll give it a go one way or another because... You know, there is plenty of time to recover after the Australian Open, kicking off in just 11 days, of course. Um, sorry, Calvin. We said, we, said, we said as well it's 11 days the Australian Open. It could easily be 13, 14 days. She could request a Tuesday. I don't even know if whether they maybe start Wednesday some of the first round matches as well. Right. Like, so yeah. under those circumstances, if she needs the extra days, two, two weeks, plenty of time for, for that kind of thing to heal. Um, slightly funny story, uh, which I think has actually been slightly misreported. Speaking of people who might not be in the draw of the Australian Open, um, Naomi Osaka is not someone we've seen a huge amount of lately. She's not played tennis in a while. Um, and the uh, Australian Associated Press, which is an agency, AAP, down under, uh, put out a story today saying mystery surrounds her playing status. She's still signed in. She's on the start list, um, but posted a load of photos on Instagram entitled Europe last week where she was um, on holiday with her boyfriend um, Corday, who I believe is a rap artist, um, one of these modern musicians, I believe, sort of speaking and rhythm, as far as I'm, I'm aware. Um, but I think that's been slightly misinterpreted that she was in Europe last week. I don't think she is. I think it, the concert was a few months ago, Ben Rothenberg tells me. Um, but George, if we didn't have Naomi Osaka again at the Australian Open, um, that... Uh, be pretty bad wouldn't it be pretty sad 
Yeah. Um, it, it, it would be bad in the sense that we want people like Naomi Osaka playing all the time. <laughs> Do I think it would be bad in terms of someone I think realistically can win this tournament right now? No. I don't mm. believe Naomi Osaka would turn up and win this tournament. I think she looked way off it last year. I think it'll take her time to get back to any level to be seriously competitive at the Slams. I think Sviontek's moved on so much that I can't look past her winning anyone but her winning this tournament. I think it'd be a major surprise if it's not Sviontek, at least in the final and probably winning it quite comfortably. Um, so yeah, it, look, it's, it's a real shame and I don't want to I'm not aiming this at her particularly because there's been lots of water under the bridge under all this, but it, it's hugely tragic that this amazing athlete, this huge voice and someone who is really engages people um, has basically left the sport. And as we spoke last week, in terms of the Forbes stuff, it's probably not going to affect her earnings. So the motivation to come back is probably <laughs> going to be fairly fairly slender in some ways and the kind of high pressure around it when she she clearly has other things that rank higher at the moment, which is, you know, totally fine, her decision. But a real shame for tennis that, you know, is short on superstar potential or at least superstar potential who's actually actualized that superstar ability by winning majors, which, you know, Osaka's won four. I think only Sviontek will be getting to that total in this little generation at the minute unless Goff can seriously step up um I was thinking about this earlier actually how many matches has Osaka played since Ash Barty retired because you think one of them's actually officially retired and the other one hasn't but I bet it's only three or four isn't it I was just trying to think I mean, it'd be more than that because she um she got to the final of Miami was that bef- was that after that Barty retired after... Yeah, okay yeah it's <clears throat> so it's like uh, but seventeen, she's yeah. I mean, she, okay. like I said, yeah. she 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 has a because because of her ranking, she started from the first round in Miami, and that's a one two eight size yeah, draw. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. I mean, I I'm with you, George. Like it it it's really a shame not to see her there. And I mean, we just have no idea what's going on in her head, and like we you know well documented battles with mental health issues and depression and anxiety and. You know, you've no idea whether that's playing a part as well. So maybe it's not a lack of motivation, but a, a motivation not to play. Um, I think maybe we just have to move on, not move on, but like assume she's not going to be there. And if she's there and she plays well, then what a magnificent bonus for the tournament. That's that's my kind of best guess. Yeah, and look, if we can. It's a pipe. If it feels a bit of a pipe dream at the minute, but if we could get back to Osaka being towards the level she was and have Sviontek at the level she is now, that could be really quite fantastic. I think mm. so. That that would be my wish for twenty twenty three by the US Open for that to somehow have manifested itself. But we'll see. Yeah, quite. We shall see. Um, I've got a couple of quick bits of news, and that is not to say they're not big. I just wanted to mention them, and I don't know how much we're going to have to say about them. Um, People may or may not have seen that Martina Navratilova has been diagnosed with stage 2 throat and breast cancer. Um, She told us that this week. She seems quite optimistic. She has had cancer before, but she um, beat it that time, and she seems optimistic that they've caught it at an early stage this time around. Um, We, all three of us, of course, wish her the very best um, and hope to see her back fighting fit soon uh, enough but I don't know how much more we have to say about that specifically um, more news breaking this week uh, Novak Djokovic looks like he's going to miss Indian Wells and Miami uh, because the USA have extended their requirement for people arriving in the country to be vaccinated against COVID until April as you can imagine all the usual suspects up in arms about that um, mentioning no names, Riley Apelka, uh, who still hasn't played tennis since August. Um, and finally, uh, my other quick hit is that Feliciano Lopez has announced that 2023 will be his final season after 25 hour, 25 years on tour. Um, 25 hours, yeah, it's a real, <laughs> real stint. Um, George, this uh, well, George and Calvin, whoever wants to jump in first. Judy Murray is obviously gutted about this. Uh, what do we think, other than that famous Deliciano Lopez comment, his legacy to the tour will be? Well, 
I mean, I, I think he's yeah, he's been a very good pro, and obviously in terms of British sense, he's always had some good grass court seasons. Done well at Queens, won singles, won the doubles. Um, you know, won the doubles with Murray there. His his most statistical legacy, James, though I think is his uh, he. He ousted Federer, I think I'm right in saying, for the most consecutive appearances at Grand Slams. I'm not sure what he's up to now, but he went past Federer around the 78 mark. So it was 78 slams in a 65 row. 65 was the record. And he went past was... him in 2018 at Wimbledon. Yeah. As, so of, the tw- as of the 2022 Australian Open, uh, it was 79 Grand Slam appearances 79. in a row. There you go. Which so I think ended is... this year, didn't it? I think it did end this year, yeah. Uh, I think it's because he lost in qualifying, actually. I think it's that a main draw. He, I think he lost in French Open qualifying, if memory serves. Oh, says. give him a wild card, RG, honestly. Come on, lads. Come on. <laughs> For um, the record. So, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's been... Um, he's been someone who's, you know, had a lot of longevity in the game. He is also a pretty good-looking bloke, so we can give him that <laughs> from Judy. Um, and also, just to say, on the uh, on the djokovic Kyrgios point... Uh, sorry, Djokovic point... Uh, he's done quite well to tactically lure everyone into thinking he's going to play doubles with Kyrgios, uh, but really put it in a in a tournament you may have already known he was not going to get into. So he's maybe <laughs> quite subtly done by Novak. Yeah, quite quite possibly. Um, would anyone? So Roger Federer is now fourth on the all time list for like consecutive Grand Slam appearances. Would anyone like to guess the other two who have gone past him? Uh, of all time, like uh, in terms of streaks of consecutive Grand Slam appearances. This is just men. Yes, yes. Mm. It's a good one question. of them is also Spanish, and one of them is Italian. Have a think. I'll ask you again, maybe next week or at the end of the podcast. It, Play along at Italian home. Italian must be like Seppi or someone. There like you that. go, Andrea Seppi, sixty-six consecutive Grand Slam appearances. I, I, I mean, the Spaniard can't be Nadal in terms of. There's no, you, of yeah, course, you can't be Nadal. Yeah, no. Um, so, sit on it. Think on it. Maybe tell me next week. Uh, we shall move on. Um, George, do you want to talk about pickle juice or do you want to talk about Boris Becker? <laughs> well, I don't have much to say on pickle juice other than it was quite amusing. A little stats. So this, this probably can factor into the quick, quick, uh, quick hits. But for those who aren't kind of on Twitter as much or watching the United Cup, you you may have missed that Parallel Bedosa. Um, there was a, she drank some pickle juice on court, and then there was a she stat was they cramping put on. right, like she was She's struggling cramping. with cramps. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a stat they put on court saying the speed of a ground strokes before and the speed of the ground strokes after, and she'd added 10 miles an hour since the pickle juice. So maybe it's one to throw at Calvin, that w- what's the pickle juice doing that's inspired such a change? <laughs> I have no idea. They don't even swallow it, do they? <laughs> this is what I can't get if it's cramp. Like, they, they swell it around their mouth and spit it out. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Do they? It's, it, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a famous old, um, isn't it a famous old, like, Eastern European hangover cure? Um, I don't know. I've heard it juice. for cramp before, but I found it bizarre that, like, the basically, I, I don't get how it how it prevents cramp or brings you back from cramp because you're not taking it into your body. I suppose you should, well. Would you like the scientific explanation? I.e., what I've just googled. Uh, pickle juice contains sodium and potassium, both of which are important electrolytes that could be lost due to exercise or excessive alcohol intake. Therefore, drinking pickle juice can theoretically help treat and correct electrolyte imbalances. And I suppose, it, I mean, if you put something in your mouth, some of it is still absorbed into your bloodstream, famously. Um, you know. But I don't get how it would be more effective than, say, drinking an isotonic drink, which is full of sodium and potassium, and you yeah. swallow it and you drink it. I mean, the one that I, when, I, when I was playing when everyone got cramped, you'd, you'd always you'd quickly down a bag of crisps because it's the right. salt in them that would... Mm. Um, you know that, and I would generally. Although cramps, one of those, you never know if it's like actually having any effect. Cramps, one of those that hits you hard for about twenty seconds, mm. and then you, you know, you're fine with it. You see footballers get it all the time, and tennis players, and they play on. So, but then if it keep, if it keeps coming, I don't know. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a strange one. It's not something I'll be trying. <laughs> um, so I meant, George, have you got have you got another point about pickle juice? Oh, I was just, well, I was just going to say, did you say that it's a, a big hangover cure, James? That, that yeah. sounds some interesting Yeah, I hear. I don't do hangovers. Um, I refuse to accept them <laughs> into my life, but um, I just get up and say I'm feeling a bit tired. 
Uh, Boris Becker is out of prison. Uh, he's been he's returned to Germany. He's going to be working the Australian Open as a pundit from Germany for uh, Eurosport over there, I believe. Says prisons made him stronger. Um, everyone I spoke to who knows Boris says he was utterly miserable, uh, despite moving to quite a nice prison in Oxford. Albeit, I appreciate that no prisons are that nice. Um, Calvin, Boris Becker, the pundit. Forget Boris Becker, the player. Where do you stand on Boris Becker, the pundit? You say that some prisons, no prisons are quite nice. A mate of mine uh, did a bit of time at Her Majesty's uh, pleasure a few years ago, and it was over the t- over the um, two thousand and five Ashes, and he said mm. it was the best six weeks of his life. He came out, he said, <laughs> he said, I watched I watched cricket all day, and I did a few art classes. It was brilliant. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Anyway, oh, the days of sport on terrestrial TV. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Um. What? Um. What was your question, James? <laughs> <laughs> Boris Becker, the pundit. Views. Um, uh, yeah. You know, it, it's one of those. He holds a bit. He holds credence because of who he is. Mm. Um. It'd be nice to have him back. You know, I think it's one of those, isn't it? You know, it's like obviously what he did was wrong. There's no question yeah. about that. As as has been mentioned before, whether the um whether the sentence was a bit extreme is, yeah. you know, but I think we can all agree it was. And now apparently he's banned from the country for the next 10 years or something. Oh uh, yeah. I, I just find bizarre. Saving. And, you know, you yeah. think of what he's brought, the pleasure he brought to people, especially in this country. And, you know, you think we could have come to a more sensible conclusion to all this and that he seems to have served his time now. And what's he going to do? It's, it's not like he's going to do the same thing again, is it? You know, it's like this is a pretty long term thing he's been doing, but you know. Yeah. Well, George getting... George is waving his head around. I don't the, know the, if it's libelous. Is... I don't know if it's libelous to say that someone might commit the same crime again. I no, think no, no. Yeah, but I mean is. I think what, I was... what I'm saying is what he did, it seems to have been done over the course of a lot of years and mismanagement of his finances, I think, and that kind of thing. Mm. And you know, it's I I just you know, I don't see putting what... him in prison isn't gonna stop that happening again. Yeah. And banning him from the country, it's like he's not, you know, banning him from coming into the country for a few weeks at Wimbledon to do some commentary where, you know, it's always nice to see him there, isn't it? So, um, I, and, you I, know, I was especially merely... when there's, there's someone, someone else called Boris who probably should be in prison for longer. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on this Boris specifically, I was going to say, he, he's a man who doesn't often seem to have learned from many of his mistakes in other regards. Well, yeah. Uh, it's it's some of his we, nickname, we, so, I don't know how much more of this from. we can actually say without <laughs> like, getting ourselves into... Uh, I, 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 prison sounds lovely, but I don't fancy it, and I can't afford the library bills. Um, let, let's get on to, very briefly, uh, and to close us uh, for this episode, uh, Calvin, you've had a very busy day because both of your players have been playing today all over the world and then tomorrow you're you're off to Portugal with Luke um, maybe let's start with with Patton and Cash or as I see Team Pat Cash I see Barry Fulcher who is Julian's yeah, coach yeah he's, he's has, branding has... it I'm still going with Henry and Julian but you know, <laughs> as is the entrepreneur of the camp so um, <laughs> I see okay a good win though into a quarter final of a 250 for the first time yeah I think. yeah uh, only their second 250 as well um, mm. so yeah it's good um, then they go I mean, they, you know, it's a, they've got a good, good, very good chance tomorrow. They'll be favourites tomorrow mm. against the two Indians. But that'd be interesting to see how they, I've no doubt they'll get a fair amount of crowds in uh, yeah. at that stadium for, for the to play the Indians. So, um, And then they go to Adelaide and then the Aussie Open. Unfortunately, I'm not going as it stands. Uh, the flights were just too expensive. Mm. Um, um, is that, I mean... They, we talked a lot, kind of off air in, in the WhatsApp group of you know about all the rankings, kind of um, wranglings to make sure they got into main draw Australian Open, which they did in, in the end quite comfortably. I mean, is there any chance they could be seeded for the Australian Open if they keep? No, winning? no, it's, there's only sixteen pairs that get seeded. So, ah, um, okay, yeah, no, there's. There, I mean, it, the strange bit is now they they'll have to do very well at this and next week and the Aussie Open to even look at getting have a chance of getting into Indian Wells because only <laughs> the top 40 get into Indian Wells so there's a likelihood regardless they could win this week they could have a good week next week and do okay at the Aussie and they would still maybe be back at challenges the week after the Aussie with the way the doubles ranking works and Luke I see won today as well playing doubles yeah, he won. He's playing challenger in Portugal with a new partner. He's playing for the f- uh, with for the first few weeks this year. A Dutch guy called Sem Verbeek. They had a tough one against two local lads. Uh, 
there's been some talk and Portuguese players and coaches are apparently known for this that Luke struggled on his serve at one end um, and there's been some talk that um, the coaches in Portugal tell their players what the signals are um, <laughs> from which is very very frowned upon yeah, and, I and, some, and I was telling someone earlier, and somebody said that is very frowned upon. Calv, even you haven't uh, added that to your repertoire of shit. <laughs> um, and it's not; it's something that you, it's, it's bottom draw. But I know Henry and Julian had mentioned it to me uh, when they played in Portugal the other week, and Barry, who was there with them at the time, said he had a serious word with the coach uh, of the other two players, um, who were both Portuguese, and then. Luke said he found it bizarre today how they seemed to know where he was going on all of his serves. Um, Cracky. And he, ser- it- he actually served, his percentages were pretty good, uh, were very good actually, but they, ju- they did just seem to be picking them a hell of a lot. Cracky. Is it, I mean, that's not against any rules, right? Um, It's not, no, but I think mainly because no one's done it. And yeah. it kind of is because it's coaching. Like so, uh, I suppose you're not, so. Yeah, you're not supposed to do it. So yeah, it is. But uh, it's one of those things that you just. I've only seen it happen on three or four occasions, and on every occasion, it's been very, very much frowned upon by everyone involved. Would, so, would you put measures in to stop that if kind of coaching everywhere became the norm? Yeah. Sounds like Barry. Like sounds like Barry might, Barry might have put some measures in himself just to prevent that <laughs> um, particular piece of coaching. <laughs> Yeah, I mean Barry's a lot more. I think Barry had a diplomatic word. I think if it was me that was there, it wouldn't. Have, it would have been a word that wasn't so diplomatic. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's difficult. I think you know it's one of those that you've got to have some level of trust, and it's just one of those that you just don't do. We can all see it. You know, I've I've been in many occasions in big matches where Luke or Henry and Jules have been playing, and I'm behind the opposition, and I can see the call that they're making. But no matter how big the point is, I, I won't. I won't make the signal myself to tell them. You just wouldn't do it. Mm. I guess it undermines the. I mean, you know, all things have a lot of trust in them, and it completely undermines the. Yeah, the whole but there's thing. a lot goes into it. You know, the lot the signal. You know, in doubles, it's a huge part, and even to the extent where, like, you know, even the players will will like Luke's quite insistent a lot of the time on to say to his partners they have to mix up the the order in which they say what they're going to do. So it wouldn't like normally say you always the first one is always wide, no, middle no t yes uh, one of his partners was always going in that order and luke thought and, and rightly because the, the other guys told him they'd figured out that when it was the first one that he said yes to it was always going to be wide and when it was yeah. the you know so there's a lot goes into the um um go on the, the, the gamesmanship the almost the, yeah. the, the signals that are made yeah uh then mm. henry and julian's match was quite weird today because the other team i'm gonna say that they lobbed 90 95 percent on return in the whole match um Jeez. and julian said to like in the in our whatsapp group after he said you know good performance missed a couple of smashes but okay and my reply was well you did hit 400 of them so missing a <laughs> couple of them isn't <laughs> um isn't a bad thing but i it was a bizarre match to watch like they just every single return went up in the air i see well, weird one. Uh, look forward, as always, to, to keeping up with them on their travels around the world. Good luck in Portugal as well, Calvin. That's all we've got time for on what is, for the last time, the Love Tennis Podcast. We'll be back next week. I'll be out in Australia. Calvin will be out in Portugal. George will be in London. Back in London. <laughs> How back exciting. <laughs> back on your mic. Um, glamorous and uh, exotic, as always. Please do leave us a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. And, uh, of course, most importantly, do come back next week. Podcast Network.